Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for joining today's webinar, Orchestrating M&A Amidst Lockdown. We've got a great panel discussion on a very timely, relevant topic that's of value for everyone in the M&A community today, and we're delighted to uh, uh, present this to you. My name is Mark Herndon. I serve as chairman of the M&A Leadership Council, and on behalf of all of our panelists, uh, the partner organizations that really comprise the uh, the, the thought leadership of the M&A Leadership Council and all of our 4,000 alumni and over 700 companies, uh, welcome. We're delighted you've joined us here today. Um, we're going to start right away with a very compelling and very recent case study by one of the most sophisticated and successful acquirers that we've come across in some time, BMO Harris Bank Acquisition. They've got some great lessons learned for us. And then we'll dive into a variety of partner organization uh, observations, frameworks, uh, insights that they're sharing with their clients, uh, brought to us both by Willis Towers Watson and M&A Partners. Along the way, we'll take some time for Q&A, so please be sure to use the Q&A pod that you see in your control panel to the right. And uh, we, we've asked each of the panelists to summarize today's discussion in some clear, actionable lessons learned and insights that will help your organizations as you plan and then begin to implement uh, your own adaptation uh, for M&A in this very challenging environment. With that, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panelists today, starting first with Paul Zorovchik. Uh, Paul is Director of Technology and Operations M&A and also serves in a dual role as U.S. Um, Corporate CIO with BMO Harris Bank. Paul brings over 20 years of uh, M&A and technology and operations experience in a variety of senior leadership roles in BMO, and he's also earned his uh, Certified M&A Specialist designation. Paul, welcome. It's great to have you on the panel today. Moving next thank to Larry Scho Yes, thank you. Uh, moving next to Larry Schoenfeld. Larry serves as Senior M&A Consultant in the Technology and Operations M&A Office of BMO Harris Bank, and similarly brings a 20-year deep subject matter expertise uh, basis of experience in technology, operations, and M&A, both with uh, BMO, Bank of America, and also with ABN AMRO LaSalle Bank. Uh, Larry also has earned his Certified M&A Specialist uh, designation. Larry, welcome, good to have you. Thanks, Mark. Moving next to Stephanie Snyder, who serves as Practice Leader of Capability Development with M&A Partners. Uh, Stephanie is uh, also a co-developer of the uh, M&A Partners Merger Max Value Creation Map, which is an end-to-end M&A lifecycle and playbook architecture. And throughout Stephanie's 30-year career in both corporate M&A and consulting, she has worked with many of the largest employers and most sophisticated acquirers throughout the telecom, banking and financial services, pharmaceutical, energy, and industrial manufacturing sectors, serving as a team member in many of the world's largest mergers up to $80 billion in transaction value. So Stephanie, great to have you on the panel today. Thanks, Mark. Turning finally to Duncan Smithson, who serves as Senior Director of M&A with global HR and human capital firm Willis Towers Watson. Uh, Duncan is a qualified actuary. He also holds the Diploma in International Employee Benefits and brings a 30-year background in both international consulting and deeply focused around M&A, working with both corporate acquirers and PE acquirers across the entire uh, life cycle of M&A, starting in strategy, diligence, transaction management, uh, pre-close integration planning, post-close integration execution, and across all forms of acquisitions, divestitures, uh, joint ventures, uh, carve-outs. So Duncan, delighted to have you and your expertise on the panel today. Welcome. Thanks, Mark. I will also point out that uh, you've probably seen Duncan and Stephanie as very popular presenters at various M&A Leadership Council workshops. And I think you can see that we've really got the voice of experience uh, on the panel today, and we're excited to, uh, to move forward. Let me just briefly set the context, why we were interested in this topic um, uh, for discussion today. A few weeks ago, the M&A Leadership Council released a brief pulse survey that perhaps some of you saw in a previous webinar, which is still on the replay link on our website. We noted two things relevant to this topic. First of all, there's a small percentage of organizations who are, say, who are saying to us, in spite of COVID, if we've got late stage deals in flight, we intend to close them as quickly as possible. And a further 12% said, we've got deals in flight that we don't know we can get to close, but we'll certainly try to renegotiate terms, conditions, valuation as best as possible and make every effort to close within a reasonable time frame. When we further explored, how are you operationally executing M&A, we saw even more organizations say, hey, it's manageable. We can do this. We figured it out. We know how to adapt even in this environment. And furthermore, we saw a few organizations that said to us, it's really not affecting us at all. It's full steam ahead with our normal M&A program. 
And that prompted a very important follow-up question. What can we learn from those acquirers that have the skill set, the capability to adapt and apply, even in this most challenging circumstance that any of us have ever seen in our careers, to execute M&A well in a post-COVID world? And that brought us to, first of all, BMO Harris Bank. Paul, your organization has a deep skill set in M&A. And if you could just tell us a little bit of background about BMO and your M&A experience to start off the case study. Thank you, Mark, and hello, everyone. Um, BMO Harris Bank, BMO Financial Group, a little bit of overview. Uh, BMO is the largest, uh, is the eighth largest North American bank by assets uh, at right around $880 billion. Um, we're integrated into uh, three operating groups, including personal and commercial banking, uh, wealth management, investment services, and uh, most importantly, our capital markets division, which we'll be focusing on today. Uh, we have around 1,200, about 12 million customers, just shy of 1,500 branches, and we employ 45,000 employees globally. Uh, regarding our M&A experience, uh, starting in 1984, we've done over 40 acquisitions of varying sizes, the largest of which was the uh, purchase in the United States of Marshall and Isley Bank, M&I, uh, in 2010. Uh, that vaulted BMO Harris Bank, our U.S. division, who uh, Larry and I work for, uh, into the uh, SIFI class, which is the systemically influencing financial institution class, meaning that if something happened to us, we would uh, influence the economy. Uh, following that, we did the G GE Transportation Finance Division acquisition, which was right around $10 billion, and Larry had a significant role in that, as well as I uh, on the uh, corporate technology side. And we've done numerous smaller and uh, other global acquisitions uh, over the course of um, those 40 that are, are listed. Um, we've, we have uh, focused our last three years on developing playbooks for each stage of the M&A life cycle from target identification through optimization, everything in between. Um, we, Larry and I uh, are working on standing up and uh, promoting a center of excellence for M&A globally, uh, enterprise-wide within BMO. Really good context, Paul. And with that, let's dive in. Tell us about Project Clementine. Certainly. So, codename Project Clementine, uh, as, as everyone in the M&A uh, world knows, we love our code names. Uh, it was a strategic fintech acquisition in the capital market space, as I mentioned. Uh, the deal thesis was to leverage uh, the Clementine Corporation's Algorithmic Management System, or AMS, uh, to provide our BMO uh, institutional clients and broker-dealers with optimal market execution. We did not have this capability in-house, and, and uh, funny enough, we were, uh, we were clients of, of Clementine since, 19, since 2018 and uh, availed ourselves of their services and, and um, found it so compelling that we, we decided to buy the company. And uh, this vaulted us into the top five capability in terms of large banks in the capital market space to execute on al algorithmic management. Uh, located in New York, New York, um, 65 FTE, highly technical mathematicians, uh, scientific uh, algorithmic coders, um, and our due diligence for this deal was completed uh, prior to uh, COVID. Uh, so um, we followed our standard business as usual due diligence processes. So our closing date was April 6th. Uh, and at that point, we were restricted by uh, COVID, uh, social distancing, uh, travel bans. Uh, we, had, uh, we had decoupled legal day one and closing day one typically we do uh, a legal day one and closing day uh, um, legal day one and conversion day one in the same uh, weekend uh, we'd, we'd had a very successful prior capital markets acquisition where we were where we did this and we leveraged uh, many of our our, our processes and procedures uh, within clementine this one was a little bit uh, interesting because we are contractually obligated to close this deal uh, within three days of uh, our regulatory uh, approval. In this case, it was FINRA. Uh, once again, I mentioned we decoupled legal day one and conversion day one uh, due to the fact that uh, you know we had to uh, we wanted to bring the the company on board into BMO and then really um, integrate them into our ecosystem. Uh, down the road because of their unique 
set up with real-time settlement and um, capabilities that weren't present with our current vendors and our current infrastructure. To do this, we had to really accelerate our HR provisioning. We are very closely partnered with our HR team, our HR acquisition and divestiture uh, area in BMO it had a much more mature process than we did when we first started out and we've become very close partners with them. We had to leverage uh, access to procurement systems um, and also you know, taking daily feeds into our financial systems for the daily P&L. Uh, starting on legal day one. Coupled with that, as many of uh, the attendees today know, we were fighting with uh, uh, VPN remote access provisioning from with the BAU functions within uh, within our bank uh, to begin with. We needed to provision um, enough uh, VPN uh, ac uh, VPN uh, access to to those forty five thousand internal BMO client uh, internal BMO employees. And we also had to provision VPN access to this new company to preserve the value of, of uh, Legal Day One. So, um, without having established processes and procedures, uh, we would not have been able to uh, do this um, in the manner that we did and as successfully we did in this uh, in this environment. Uh, once again, we had a people focus, um, and we wanted to preserve and really uh, show the new employees from Clementine. Um, that uh, we really cared about their experience on legal day one. Excellent. It's a good setup. And uh, then the fun begins, right? Uh, tell us a little bit more about how you got through the integration uh, planning and uh, execution in the heat of what was going on in the market uh, at that time with uh, the, the capital markets of, and trading focus. Sure, Mark, this is Larry. So um, when the purchase agreement and the press release went out on uh, January 22nd, uh, we were confident that the closing could be completed in 11 weeks. Uh, we were on target to have all our dedicated circuits and all the dual laptops available at the sites, having all the access to the corporate systems in place for employee onboarding, all the cross connectivity between the BMO and the Clementine systems in place for all the operational and governance oversight activities that needed to occur on um, the day after closing. Then COVID-19 hit, right? And New York City was hit pretty hard. In early March, all the BMO and Clementine resources started to move off site. All the office buildings were being shut down and effectively all of our planning around the dedicated network connectivity was lost. Um, so we started the pivot to the virtual closing. As uh, Paul had noted, uh, a lot of that was a major shift toward VPN uh, remote access, uh, utilizing some offline system uh, capabilities, and also additional workarounds uh, to solution everything to meet the uh, closing requirements. Uh, one of the critical cons concerns that we had was the actual execution of the closing event itself. Uh, in the past, we had done those using a physical command center structure. And actually, our M&A office had, had built a strong competency of uh, delivering that both during closing and conversion day event. And really our core principle around that whole management was to have physical command centers. But what we actually experienced was that our all the work that we had put into the phys physical command center structure actually benefited us. Uh, we had the benefit of a playbook that was designed with minute by minute tasks. It identified all the cross dependencies. It had named resources performing the tasks, all the backup resources that, that would need to do them in the event they weren't available and then a full set of escalation contact information uh, to, to deliver uh, virtually. And also with the issue management plans, uh, they were, you know, we have clear defined roles, we have clear communication, you know, dial in numbers, preset, triage structure, and that all adapt, adapted very well to the uh, virtual environment. And then finally, uh, the reporting segment of the command center, uh, th we were able to leverage the tools and the process that we had in place uh, and it converted well to a visual, uh, virtual type environment. And then the, um, so basically what that resulted in is we now have a virtual command center um, competency as part of our team. And Mark, probably the last item from a planning ad adaptation standpoint uh, is that we learned is, uh, Paul had mentioned about the, the need to do the early um, engagement uh, to enable to do the, the turnover based on the three-day uh, regulatory approval. Mm -hmm. So not having a close date made it difficult for our HR system to onboard resources. So we had a, and the HR system is kind of the, the start of the provisioning process for, for a new employee. So we had to rework uh, that process uh, 
uh, kind of jury rig the uh, pre-provisioning process and get our, our critical systems provision like Global Relay in advance um, to ensure that we are ready for day one. Excellent insights, uh, Larry, thank you. And then certainly um, on the other big ad adaptation for the virtual process was on the communication and culture side. Uh, so BMO, as Paul noted, is a 40,000 plus uh, employee organization. It's process heavy. We're scaled for standard onboarding with limited ability to pivot to non-standard approaches. Clementine was coming on board, 65 FTE. They were a FinTech type organization. Uh, they were delivering those record volumes uh, created by COVID-19. So we needed to adapt and uh, support them uh, to ensure we had a positive employee experience. So we accomplished that first through transparency and, transparency and over communication. It started up front with uh, working closely with, with some of the key partners on the, on the Clementine side. Uh, we had to work through making sure they, the BMO organization understood the priority of what we we're trying to do. We we'll worked through all the freezes that were in place and we also had to customize the, the processes uh, the best we could uh, to meet the needs of the uh, Clementine resources. And that led to a, a white glove approach. So we, um, we had a, a, a few dedicated resources exclusively to the rollout uh, of, of the uh, resources. Uh, they provided, we provided both general office hours and then one-on-one uh, -on -one scheduling. And we all work closely with the Clementine team, uh, their support resources to get them ready and also provide the support. And then finally, we did a lot of customization of the uh, welcome guides, remote access guides, the training guides, uh, all with the focus on our, uh, our our new Clementine resources. They did not have standard BMO laptops. They were working on numerous types of devices running multiple operating systems. So we were used to we're rolling things out on our core. So we did a lot of adjustments to those procedures and it, it, it really paid off in the, in the long run with improving the employee experience. Mm. Larry, it seems like a year ago now, but in early um, April, uh, late March timeframe, the markets were literally going crazy with uh, volume, volatility. Paul, you addressed that a minute ago. And you know that whole approach that you took from the planning, uh, the virtual uh, control rooms, and then the um, tremendous communication and change sounds easy, uh, but, but it's certainly not, especially when your job number one, rightly so, is preserving and sustaining the ability of the target company to operate and execute in, in the midst of that environment. So it's a really compelling case, guys, and, and well done. Uh, Paul, I want to tie back to something that you shared with us in the planning stage of this uh, a few weeks ago. You shared with us a quote that I felt like would really resonate with the M&A leadership uh, community uh, out there and our alumni and, and anybody that's doing M&A. Um, Tell us that story. What was the quote? Oh, Mike. Need a mic. Yep. This is a quote by one of my favorite jazz. A quote by one of my favorite jazz musicians, Charlie Bird Parker. Um, first, you learn the instrument, then you learn the music, then you forget about all that stuff and and just play. Um, in in M and A, we have to improvise so many different times. Um, you know, the uh, the uh, the song remains the same, but the arrangements are different. Um, we can lump things into general categories, but um, we, we have to have those uh, mastery of your instrument, your your tools, your playbooks, um, and the deal thesis, understanding what you're going for. And then, you know, when you're when you're faced with something like COVID-19, you just leverage all of that forget about it and execute and just play the music. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what we did in this instance. It's, it's very memorable uh, and it's great advice from a lessons learned standpoint and a true voice of experience. So Paul, that's uh, uh, very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, let me do this. Let me give you guys just a little bit of a break and I wanna bring in um, our two uh, partner organization panelists, Stephanie Snyder with m a Partners and Duncan Smithson from Willis Towers Watson. And both of your organizations routinely work with uh, very skillful acquirers uh, globally, as well as those just starting out in their m and journey. And we wanna zero in a little bit more on what you're telling these folks. What are you advising them to do? What are you hearing from acquirers um, about their challenges in, in adapting? Uh, Stephanie, first to you, please. Well, thanks, Mark. Uh, the role of my team here at M&A Partners is to help companies develop their m and capability and readiness. And uh, we do that across the entire deal life cycle. So starting with strategy and targeting, all the way through due diligence, integration planning, integration execution, all the way to long-term value creation. So, you know, really we're partnering with those clients to try to help them become less dependent over time on third-party resources. 
So like BMO, some of our clients are very sophisticated. Uh, some of them have very uh, well-documented MA processes. They have comprehensive playbooks. They're very experienced team members on their teams, but other clients are just starting out with all of this. They're doing M&A maybe for the first time or they haven't done it in a while. And then in the middle, there are all those clients that are still struggling with the biggest issues, which is things like ineffective governance and uh, unclear roles and responsibilities for their teams or budgeting issues around integration, you know, all those typical things that we hear over and over from people who are developing their M&A capability and readiness. But today in this environment, I mean, the two big questions that seem to be on everybody's mind are, what does the future look like for M&A and how soon is that future gonna get here? And uh, all that uncertainty and lack of predictability has caused a lot of clients to kind of go on pause. They've, they've hit that pause button, they're in a wait and see mode, uh, just like you saw in the, the MALC um, survey. Again, others are turning on their fog lights and they're proceeding with caution. They're going very slowly and carefully, but they're making progress. And then, you know, there are those that are just full speed ahead, like you said. They are all out and taking advantage of these opportunities that may not exist uh, once this new normal approaches. So, you know, the key message that I want to deliver today is that each organization should be thinking beyond the simple M&A process and mechanics. Uh, they need to think about that whole strategic context that they're operating in. And just like Larry and Paul said, uh, they're able to make music in this time period because they had those fundamentals in place. Um, if you don't have those fundamentals in place, then your M&A just becomes a bunch of noise and not music. And so we want to be able to get those fundamentals in position so that we can then play off of that and focus on the real value creation that we need to adapt to in this environment. Now, if you look at what that new strategic context might look like, um, you know, it might look like reviewing your, your whole deal life cycle and seeing what does our M&A future hold. Uh, are we doing different deal types in the future? Might we have a different deal pipeline than we had, either opportunistically or because we've changed our strategic intent a little bit? Um, what does we look like for a timeline for integration complete? And then what kind of constraints might we be facing during this time frame? Or is cash a big issue or resources limited? You know, all of those kinds of things. The second thing that we really need to look at then is, you know, what enterprise and make capabilities need to be revisited at this time? And again, that's looking at all those, those elements of capability that are going to be important. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. And then finally, where could we make some upgrades to our MA process? And, and then how can we adapt some of the ones that already exist? So, uh, we, you know, we're really looking at some of the areas that worked well for us in the past that now in this new virtual environment may need to yeah. be adapted. So next slide, Mark, and I'll just go into a little bit more detail sure. in there. Um, what we recommend doing at this time for companies, regardless of where you are and what your strategic context is, is sit down and think about what your life cycle looks like and what you might need to be doing differently given the current environment and constraints. So if you look at the chart on the left-hand side of the page, if we start with due diligence, everybody knows that their due diligence checklist was already pretty intensive. <laughs> and so now we have all kinds of new risks that are being introduced in this environment. And those need to get added in to assess those risks realistically. So can we prioritize our due diligence request list, take off some things that maybe could wait a little later and get the information down when we get into discovery or integration planning? Is there a way that we can streamline and prioritize it for the target company so they know what's most urgent for us to see first? Uh, are there ways to think about you know, on-site physical inspections differently? Do If we can't be there in on person, in person, looking at it, sensing it, feeling it, uh, understanding it with all of our senses, uh, what could we do? Could we engage third-party local resources that could you know, perform the diligence for us in a certain area? Could we videotape. I mean, some companies are getting very creative uh, looking at outdoor sites via drones. I mean, there's all kinds of creative initiatives going on to make due diligence work better in this virtual environment. And then things like meetings with management. Um, you know, that's how we typically get our confidence level, our sense that, yes, this is a deal we want to do. Uh, yes, we can trust these people. Yes, we respect these people. Yes, this is a good business. If we can't do those meetings in person, if they have to be virtual, what can we do to make that work better? And uh, so, you know, some of the recommendations there are just chunk it down into smaller meetings, have a very specific agenda on a certain topic. Uh, don't try to cover, you know, boil the ocean in one meeting with management. So 
uh, you know, if you're going to have a meeting on, say, you want to get a little bit more information about their culture, you may not want to call it culture at that point. You may want to call it operating style uh, and talk about their operating model and business model. So those kinds of things are all things that you need to yeah. think about differently around due diligence. Then around things like big room planning. I mean, we're all used to being able to get in a room together and work out some very difficult things, do big kickoffs, uh, do integration planning workshops, uh, work on dependency mapping, all those kinds of things we're used to being face to face. Uh, not that some companies haven't been doing them virtually all along, they have, and we've certainly done them as well. But I think in this environment, we have to really think about and be more intentional about how we get that work done. And that may mean breaking it down into smaller sprints, uh, having more focus on process facilitation during the meetings, um, you know, all those kinds of things that could make it more effective for the participants and make sure that everybody's engaged and aligned in that. Stephanie, that's great. And uh, you bring up uh, so many different compelling points there. Uh, we had a chance to do an online due diligence uh, workshop with the M&A Leadership Council uh, literally last week. And uh, we heard our financial due diligence partner, Tony Inlow, talk about uh, EBITDAC uh, and one of the variations in due diligence uh, post-COVID. Uh, earnings before interest tax, depreciation, amortization, and COVID. So how do we get our arms around the target companies? projection model, uh, recovery plan, um, how do we um, offset or adjust and uh, deal with uh, addbacks, for example, uh, to EBITDA in a smaller private company. So it's really wise advice, Stephanie. Thank you for laying out a number of these things and a process that organizations can follow as they think about their typical M&A approach and mindset and how and, how and what needs to be adapted. Uh, Duncan, I wanna bring you into the conversation here because Willis Towers Watson for years has been a very noted thought leader and true expert in all factors M&A pertaining to uh, human capital, uh, the HR organization, people and risk, uh, benefits, uh, compensation, et cetera. And you're also a noted uh, research-based organization, really pushing the thought leadership in M&A and really all uh, topics above. What are you, what are you hearing? What are you uh, talking with your clients about these days? Well, thanks, Mark, and uh, hi, everyone. So we, we went out, uh, you know, really when uh, the coronavirus lockdown was starting to have a noticeable impact on deal-making activity, and we had discussions with um, a large number of experienced serial acquirers and divestors. And by serial acquirer, what I really mean is companies that in a normal year, in a typical year, would do uh, dozens, in some cases, even scores of acquisitions and or divestitures. So, so these, these companies really know their stuff. They have strong in-house HR M&A teams, typically, or strong HR leadership with good experience of, uh, of M&A. Um, and we basically collated their, their, their insights, how it was impacting them, how they were reacting. The first thing to note is it's quite interesting that the, the time frame that companies are using to analyze uh, the impact of the virus uh, is evolving. And the priorities of serial acquirers and serial divestors evolves as well, depending on when you're looking. So there was, um, for many companies, an immediate short-term reaction to the shock, both economic and health and social impact of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And very roughly, I think we saw that uh, manifest in March, April. I think some companies are still experiencing a little bit of that. Right. Companies generally now seem to be pivoting to restoring stability. Um, and we expect that to continue to play out maybe for the rest of Q2 and into Q3 of this year. And then ultimately what companies are looking to do is, if necessary, modify their approach, modify their process, uh, and just in terms of not just... Uh, uh, identifying and bringing in transactions, but then executing on those transactions and really learning how to operate and sustain in the quote unquote, the new normal. And we, we think that's gonna, we're gonna start seeing that towards the end of this year and, and beyond. Excellent, thank you. So, you know, you know what exactly are companies telling us? Um, we think it breaks, breaks down into three major themes. Companies are looking at recent and current deals, they're looking at their portfolio and future deal flow. And to be honest, they're looking at the HR M&A team itself and how it works, how knowledge is, is shared and accumulated um, and how the team is deployed. When it comes to recent and current deals, um, nearly all companies temporarily paused new deal activity 
to review their current and recent deals. And that the focus was very much on revalidating the strategic rationale for a transaction, uh, looking at potential adjustments to the scope of a deal or the structure of a deal, looking at potential changes that might be needed to the, the pricing model, you know, to the, the valuation. Are those earnings projections still relevant in, uh, in the new era of COVID-19? Um, companies were revisiting their funding mechanisms. So for example, one client told us they would typically uh, make an acquisition by means of an upfront purchase price. They are much more uh, focused now on uh, using earnouts um, and putting in place some metrics that look at in more detail than they had previously on business viability, on revenue growth, and so on. Um, companies are reassessing their go/no-go -no criteria. You know what what makes for a um, an, a leading indicator of a success, the success of a deal. Um, and then there are some practical implications. We're seeing and our clients are seeing times to closing deals that have been signed, the time to closing is being pushed back further and further. Mm -hmm. And there are also some practical considerations, uh, things like mandatory employee consultations, regulatory approvals. These things, there are workarounds to not being able to do these things in person, uh, but the general consensus is that it's taking much, much longer than previously to get through these, these things. And in yes. some cases, when, they, when companies reassess all of that, the decision is maybe we shouldn't proceed with the deal. And that, that obviously brings its own challenges. You know, if, you, um, you know, if you're re reviewing a deal construct and you're thinking maybe this deal no longer makes sense, but you want to retain the ability to go back to the seller at a future point if it makes sense, it's quite a delicate negotiation to disengage from a deal that's already in flight. Right. Excellent. I, I can talk about other things that companies are telling us. Um, you know, companies are definitely uh, looking at the impact of market movements on earnouts, retention programs. Uh, those remain important. Um, uh, companies are looking at additional HR metrics that, that they can tie into uh, the, the payout from earnouts and retention programs. Um, for recently closed deals, companies are also reviewing their 100-day plans. Um, I have a client who's engaged in a fairly, fairly substantial, fairly transformational deal currently. They're in the pharmaceutical industry, so you know, right, you know, fortunately for them, they are not as negatively impacted financially as That's companies right. in some other industries. Absolutely. There will be but some they, real bright spots out there. It's a great point, Duncan. There will be, and we, we can talk about that um, in a bit. But, you know, they, they told me that they were planning to integrate the acquired employees from their recent acquisition onto their HR systems, plans, and programs as soon as possible. That was their original intention. Um, but they've now decided to delay that for a year. And, you know, fortunately for them, they, they acquired... Uh, it was a stock deal, so they acquired the, the target company, Lock, Stock and Barrel, including uh, existing payroll and HR systems and so on. They've decided to wait a year, partly to reduce the disruption to their new associates, the newly acquired employees, and also partly to reduce the pressure on their own HR team. Yes. Um, companies are looking at new integration approaches, and I, I, think, uh, I think Stephanie referred to this, um, you know, do you absolutely need to harmonize the target company onto every aspect of, of you, the buyer? Uh, or is there a way of focusing only on what's absolutely required? Things like mm -hmm. uh, right. risk and compliance, but otherwise retaining, or allowing the target company to retain some autonomy in areas such as non-executive compensation and benefits. Companies are also looking at or uh, reassessing synergy realization and termina terminations in the context of the crisis. And this is a really uh, delicate topic companies are finding. Um, buyers that in the past might have had uh, no concerns whatsoever about, uh, you know, treating people with respect and, you know, offering generous severance and retraining and redeployment packages. But if the business case uh, called for some restructuring of the workforce, simply going ahead and accepting that that was an, an unnecessary or necessary uh, challenge that had to be dealt with as part of the transaction. Companies are a lot more sensitive about right. doing that, we found, in the era of uh, the coronavirus, where, you know, in the US, for example, something, you know, official unemployment just is close to 15% uh, right now. And Economists say that the unofficial figure is probably more like 20 to 25 percent. Right. Uh, so companies are very sensitive about employee experience, uh, their culture, their brand, their reputation, um, considerations such as that. 
Um, and then, you know, if we look at uh, and we talk about uh, portfolio and future deal flow, um, it really is a tale of two halves. Some, uh, mm -hmm. some companies uh, have been particularly impacted by the crisis, unfortunately, and, and they are reviewing their portfolios with a focus on uh, defensive partnerships or in some cases outright sales and divestitures. Um, and it, it just depends on the industry. Um, you know, we were speaking to the M&A lead at a travel business and uh, she said they are anticipating a wave of sales to hit yes. their sector. Um, other companies in other industries, and you can think biotech, pharma, medical devices, although I will say you've got, you know, what do you mean by medical device? You can't, you can't always just, sure. um, you know, switch a, a manufacturing right. operation that makes surgical meshes to producing ventilators. But in general, some companies are doing, are doing okay, um, and they're actually working to identify potential opportunistic acquisitions. And then finally, there's the impact on uh, HR, you know, the HR m and team itself. And, you know, Paul and Larry spoke about the challenges of extending VPN access to uh, the acquired employees. And that, that's, a tech, that's been a technological challenge for many companies. I think, fortunately, a lot of HR m and teams are used to working virtually, at least when they work internally with themselves. A lot of companies, their HR expertise when it comes to m and is spread around the country and around the world. So it That's hasn't right. been such a hardship, but there's more to it than, uh, than uh, VPN and technology. And some companies have been struggling to, or, or having to find workarounds to uh, run uh, virtual due diligence. You know, how, how do you do, and I think Stephanie referred mm -hmm. to this, how do you That's do right. an effective um, uh, management presentation when you really, you know, yes, you're there for the content, but you're also trying to look uh, in the whites of your the, the whites of the eyes of the people across the table and get their measure and get the former judgment on the talent and the leadership Excellent. in front of you. Yeah. Uh, how do you do that virtually? So companies have been struggling, and they've also had to, in some cases, redeploy their HR M&A expertise. Companies that aren't busy right. have found that they can take some of their M&A people and ha have them backfill support for the, for example, the benefits team where people are rushed off their feet trying to cope with the, the response to coronavirus. Alternatively, if um, early stages of a deal were, were run very centrally by the, H, the corporate HR team, maybe now what you have to do is leverage your local HR teams more and earlier than you would have otherwise to bring them into uh, under the tent, as it were, on deals in play so that you, yeah. can, you can play off the fact that maybe they aren't under the same lockdown conditions as the corporate team. Excellent. Duncan, uh, tremendous insights. I want to leverage off of that and bring Paul and Larry back into the conversation if we can. Um, watching the questions box, we've gotten a number of really outstanding questions. We want to try to get to as many of these as possible. If you haven't had a chance to ask a question, uh, please use your Q&A pod in the control panel uh, at the right-hand side of your screen. And um, here's, here's an interesting one, uh, Paul and Larry, uh, coming right to you um, from the outset. Liam has asked, uh, BMO has a very mature M&A process and skill set. Uh, what's your advice for a less experienced acquirer? Well, uh, you know, we were in this position, you know, a couple of years ago, and and the bottom line is that you have you have to call in the cavalry sometimes. You have to reach out for help. Um, there are various uh, third-party firms out there that you can reach out to. Um, various industry organizations we've done we we do a lot of research and we um we quickly integrate things we call from the internet from conversations with folks like you all um you know develop uh you know one, one of the things that uh highly value added um aspects of being in this work is that there's a really robust uh behind the scenes mm -hmm. uh, uh, fraternity of folks that um, get together and share ideas. And if it doesn't have anything to do with the deal and it has to do with execution and things that aren't uh, deal related, people are more than willing to share that information. And, and I encourage folks to, to do that. But bottom line is you got to reach out for help when, uh, in, in a situation like this. Thank you. I'm going to go next to a question that's just come in from uh, Emma. And, and uh, looks like this is targeted to, to Duncan. Um, 
uh, each organization has spoken to some of the challenges when it comes to employee communication and building trust without the in-person contact and in-person meetings. What are some additional examples of things we can do to drive more effective comms change and build trust? So Duncan, start out with you, mm -hmm. and I suspect you know we want to all get involved in that conversation a little bit. Absolutely, you know it's a, it's a good question. Um, co companies are telling us that engaging people remains difficult, um, and teleconferencing, for all its advantages, uh, it, it's not the same as being there in person. You know, we we had a client where for them uh, the day one onboarding of newly acquired employees was it was a big deal. And now, of course, they uh, they have travel restrictions. They have uh, they can't hold face to face meetings. So basically, there is there is no welcome for those employees. And even behind the scenes, they can't send people from the IT or finance functions to help integrate the acquisition. Um, so employees are really feeling that. So I, th I think you know the example that Paul and Larry shared of BMO's approach in Project Clementine, the white glove approach, mm -hmm. is is uh, for all its virtual, it's it's going above and beyond what you would normally do, even if that was already uh, leaning towards over communication. Uh, you know, companies, and this this affects uh, existing employees. It's not just acquired employees. Companies are doing right. their best to stand behind and support their people. Um, I, I'll let others speak, but there's an, added, there's an added complication when you're talking about associates in manufacturing plants where they don't really have the option of working from home. Um, and companies are looking to do things like, you know, extend the availability of personal protection equipment like hand sanitizers, um, things like that, but also looking at emotional well-being and mental aspects, you know, extending paid sick leave. We had one client who was looking to accelerate in negotiation with their EAP vendor, their employee assistance program, access to their the buyer's EAP program for the acquired target company employees before the right. deal actually closed. Really good crisp examples. Thank you for those, Duncan. Um, Stephanie, any thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, just, I mean, it's, m and always creates uncertainty. Now it's on steroids. So how do we deal with that? Um, you know, I think there's uh, some psychological principles that you can apply. There's something called mere exposure, and that simply means that the more you expose people to something, the more they trust and like it. So that goes to the frequency of communication that you're doing. Now, the flip side of that is if you make a bad first impression, then they hate you more each time. So first impressions really matter here in how you set that up. Uh, but there's some just good principles for making time to do some of the trust building, some of the get to know me, um, we've had teams that have shared pictures of their pets online, just a way to humanize it, make that connection, start to build that trust, develop that credibility, uh, and you know establish those relationships that are so hard to do in a virtual environment. Yeah, that's great. I want to stay with you, Stephanie. You've uh, touched a real nerve here in the Q&A pod. There's a ton of questions around how do you do what Larry and Paul did you know, going from a physical control center, but applied to what you mentioned, Stephanie, about integration planning and particularly those cross-functional dependencies. Um, here's here's a question, for example, that uh, Lucas has asked. Um, we've got a well-developed baseline integration plan, very experienced function work stream leads, but we've always done that proverbial physical walk the wall session to identify and map dependencies between function teams. How in the world do you do that without the wall walk session, Stephanie? The short answer is very carefully. Um, it, it's really tough, and we would certainly prefer to do that face-to-face. -face. It's a very complicated exercise. It requires a lot of collaboration. You're going to get more creativity in the room. People are going to establish those relationships of trust. There's no substitute for being face-to-face -face in some yeah. of those more difficult big plan, big room planning sessions. But the truth of the matter is there have been circumstances in the past where we haven't been able to do that on site, face-to-face, -face, and we've done it virtually. And so what did that require? Well, it typically required a ton more design into the meeting up front, designing that meeting to get the outcomes that you need, designing it with the participants in mind. Um, we might spend, you know, 30 hours developing one hour of meeting content for a meeting like that. And so it's just putting the design time in front. It's really thinking yeah. through from a participant's perspective how to make that work. And then absolutely holding people accountable between that. If you're running sprints, 
then what do they need to be doing in terms of work between each sprint to get the work done? So that's great. Accountability there, just responsibility, all that, all that good meeting principles. Yeah, you can't just expect to uh, put your note cards on the wall and uh, by time phrase, thir frame uh, day one, 30, 60, 90, and expect people to do it. It all has to take place ahead of time. And you've yeah. got to work that and then really have the detailed conversations uh, remotely. So great insights and coaching, Stephanie. Thank you. We've got a bunch of questions here for Paul and Larry. A lot of interest in the BMO uh, example. And um, let me ask kind of a two-part question. I'll, I'll actually combine questions here. Uh, Isabella has asked Paul and Larry, talk more about preserving value in the target company at closing and post day one in, in light of the record trading volume. How did you do that? And then I'm going to tag on to that if I can pick up a question um, that, um, uh, let's see, uh, Adam has asked, uh, what worked and didn't work as you adapted from your core process to this environment? Help us out with I that, mean, Paul and Larry. Sure. I mean, uh, on the first question, certainly we tried to keep the closing simple, right? So we didn't make any major changes in in you know, the way we cleared transactions. We kept the core systems in place, you know, at, at Clementine. What we focused on was the corporate systems and making sure that they were all, you know, appropriately integrated and we had the right level of oversight and governance. So we didn't we didn't touch the core. Uh, regarding the second item, I mean, certainly we had some good experience around just, I would say, even in the email process, right? So until everybody is fully onboarded and able to access all your intranet sites and, and, and all the systems they, they're required to access. Don't start, you know, sending them or forwarding them your blanket, your, your avalanche of, of corporate emails. Uh, so try to, try to kind of ease them into the, uh, the, the process of, of onboarding during those first couple of weeks. Uh, because it sounds like the voice important. of experience there, Larry. Yeah. It's uh, sage advice, and we've all been there, done that. If they don't need it from yeah, and just, right away, yeah, yeah. It, just to just to add on to that, um, we preserve value by letting the acquired business focus on what value they are providing. And you know, we talked about white glove. We led and handholded people through things so they they could focus on in their managing that volatility and trading volume. And we kind of did not do that process before, as Larry mentioned, you know, you'd get a checklist provided via email to a new employee. They'd have to walk through it themselves. We have to take a more measured uh, and handholding approach. And it just shows that we value the, the new employee. And, and that goes a long way in really starting the relationship off. And it really goes back to due diligence. When we have our face-to-face -face meetings or our calls with, management and you know, when we can't find answers in the virtual data room you know we start to develop that collegial relationship from day one and um you know some some folks aren't willing to play that but we've been very fortunate to have willing partners uh in our recent transactions and, and it's made it much easier to do that let me just ask a follow-on question to to that and and i'll start with paul and larry and ask uh duncan and and stephanie to get to this as well but uh, you've referred to the white glove approach a couple of times, which means a step up level of service, responsiveness, support, as you've described. Um, what, what else does that look like? You know, physically from a structure, systems, process, staffing, what are just two or three other examples of what you did to step up that level of service to white glove level? Yeah, I think one of the things we did was we, we sat down with the support group from Clementine to better understand their user experience, right? Certainly in a remote environment and compare that to what would be delivered from a big corporate organization like ours and kind of understood those differences beforehand and took that into all the customization, the, the white gloving that we did. And we also included them as part of our support team. So uh, that helped. Great insights. Any other comments on that? I think uh, one of the one of the one of the telltale uh, things was, um, you know, in our first meeting after we went uh, live on Legal Day One, um, we had a number of folks that uh, joined from Clementine that says, "Hi, I'm Charles from Clementine," and we went, "No, you're Charles from BMO now," and right. you know, we we just went the extra mile to make them feel welcome and and do that transition. Inclusiveness, yeah, great example. Stephanie, you were yeah, starting to say. I mean asking the target what will work for them is probably the best starting point. So I think a lot of us think we know best what how to do something. 
And sometimes right. kind of forget to step back and ask them what might work best for you. Um, so just in this environment, especially if they are already in a huge pressure chamber uh, around getting their daily work done, how little can we distract them and what would that look like? And just having those conversations right up front to establish that and then trying to adapt our processes to meet their needs. I think the most dangerous thing that some people do is they kind of go on autopilot with M&A. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they here's our process and we're going to follow it come hell, hell or high water. And so we, we want to pull off that autopilot and really think about what's going to create value here and what's going to work for this target. Excellent. Hey, Duncan, uh, you also uh, kind of touched off a, a nerve here in the comments about um, uh, restructuring and the brand customer experience, the employee experience aspect of uh, anticipated restructurings in this deal environment and uh, layoffs uh, post-close. Uh, this question has come in from, from Mason, and it really speaks to retention. Um, he's saying, uh, how important is retention in today's environment? And if so, what changes in approach might be needed? Uh, that's another good question. Thank you. Um, retention is still as necessary as it ever was. And I think what's changed is in a world where the infrastructure or support for M&A, even in situations where companies are trying to accelerate deals that are in flight and bring them to, to close, um, I think the support infrastructure is moving more slowly. Things like, you know, as I said, regulatory approval, for example, or background checks, you know, whereas before, if it took five to 10 days to conduct a background check, that's now, you know, vendors are telling companies that's going to take 20 to 30 days or whatever it is. I, I think if the timeline is stretched longer, then uh, companies have to relook at their retention plans. And, and you know, if, if it's the case, uh, and, you know, some deals, some deals are about uh, intellectual property or physical assets, but if there are people involved, um, which is most of the, the deals where, which have the most complex issues, um, you need, you know, the people who are going to drive value in the future and the people who are going to help you through the transition, you need to keep them. It's that right. simple, um, especially if the transition is going to take longer than it would have previously. Very, very good insight. Uh, uh, we're close to time and I want to commit that we will get to our summary insights. As I mentioned, I've asked each of the panelists to characterize the entire discussion here into some clear, actionable lessons learned and takeaway insights that each of your respective organizations can use in your planning and, and pivoting to this new environment. So we'll do that next, but I have to get to this one last question that's come in for BMO. And uh, this is from Paul who says, uh, clarify a little bit the corporate organization and scope. Within BMO, is most of M&A integration led from a dedicated M&A organization or is there uh, much from the BMO, BMO business and who owns the resulting integrated business? Just a little bit of context on your scope and, and role there, Paul and Larry. You want me to take that, Larry? Sure, Paul. Yeah, so we have a dedicated M&A function internally at BMO and we, we're, our area is actually, um, Larry and my area is actually uh, accountable for the end-to-end -end delivery of, of all M&A. And we do that across, um, across uh, the entire organization. Uh, that wasn't the case in the past. There were pockets where business led um, things, uh, deals in the past. We work very closely with our business partners in corporate development to uh, facilitate. Um, and, and the efficiency and effectiveness gains from this model have been immense. Um, and I, it, it, as a matter of fact, I don't think there's any other way that you, you can do it. You have to have a dedicated team if you wanna do it and do it well in a repeatable fashion. I'm really glad that question came up and thank you for, for taking that. Your scope and role is definitely more of an enterprise operations focus uh, than a typical IT scope uh, kind of function work stream. It's really uh, performing a lot of roles of enterprise DMO and IMO um, for the operations. Yeah, excellent. With that, guys, I want to transition now to our closing comments and uh, again, turning to our distinguished guests, Paul and Larry from BMO. Uh, first of all, my congratulations. Uh, you guys have done an outstanding job in a very difficult circumstance and a highly strategic acquisition that it may be small, but it is not easy in that environment and with the overall value proposition that you're expecting for them and the operations focus that they had to maintain. So well done and uh, thank you for sharing your insights. Uh, sum up for, you, for us, if you will, please, Paul and Larry, some of the key takeaways. 
Well, well, thank you, Mark. Well, as I've, I think I, the theme that has bubbled up over this uh, past hour has been you have to have a solid M and A process and playbooks in advance. And if you don't have that as the questioner asks, you have to reach out for help. And then um, I would add on to that: once you have those that baseline playbook and and processes in place, you have to keep your what I call the M and A engine at idle in between deals. If you're not a serial acquirer and not busy all the time, you tend to lose that value. Um, so keep the engine running by um, one way you do that is you, you embed your best practices and lessons learned into your M&A teams. And we have dedicated M&A teams. We have dedicated partners throughout every aspect of what we call corporate support areas. And we perform lessons learned after every deal. And we are religious about um, plowing those back into our, our, our program. Uh, and finally, um, you need to elevate and adapt your frameworks and guiding principles. You can't just virtualize them in, in something like this. Some things just don't lend themselves to the virtual environment. And as Stephanie and Duncan both mentioned, you really have to pick and choose um, what makes sense, the low hanging fruit, so to speak, um, what makes sense to virtualize. Um, but pick the ones that are going to give you the most uh, bang for your buck, so to speak, in terms of um, virtualizing in, in, in an environment such as COVID-19. Excellent. In my three uh, key takeaways, are certainly the virtual versus the physical presence mandates uh, an elevated white glove process. And like we said, listen to the support groups uh, from the acquired. Uh, they'll provide you the best insight and where you need to apply that. Uh, it helps to have a motivated, engaged target company counterpart. And again, uh, in, I found that engaging them with and solutions using transparency goes a long way. Um, it, we know we're a big company, but we don't have all the answers. And they must be able, they must be want to be part of the organization. And those seeds are certainly planted in due diligence and cultivating through the process. So you can never start that uh, relationship building uh, any earlier. You can, you can, you need to start at day one. So excellent. Thank you both. And Stephanie and Duncan. Well, really quickly, uh, you know, basically virtual M&A is simply good M&A performed virtually. So again, just like Paul and Larry have said, have those foundations in place so that you can call audibles on the field. Um, you know, it, it make implicit um, explicit. So don't leave people wondering what you mean by something. Um, you know, don't make assumptions. Uh, and then, you know, basically M&A will be back. We are hearing from all the experts that there will be an uptick stabilize and the new normal presents itself. So if you have some time now, uh, if you're experienced, then look at uh, new inventures that you might have. Look at divestitures, look at carve-outs, uh, you know, all the kinds of things that you might not be as expert at as you are at M&A because those are likely to appear as well. And if you're just starting, then just like Larry and Paul said, you know, get an expert on your team so that you can avoid those landmines. Excellent. Duncan. Thanks, Mark. Uh, think creatively, think the unthinkable. Get creative about deal structure. Ask yourself, are those non-negotiables really non-negotiable? Uh, challenge yourselves. Uh, deals may have paused or slowed down temporarily, but companies with cash reserves are still gonna do deals. So deals are still happening and be open to those opportunities. And companies are using uh, this crisis, uh, they're finding it, some silver lining, which is, you know, it's a chance to uh, pressure test their playbooks, their way, their approach. Uh, companies are finding new ways to deploy their teams that are effective and efficient. Wonderful. And that's a great uh, capstone uh, opportunity for all of us to say thank you for joining us at this webinar today. Again, congratulations, uh, Paul and Larry, for an outstanding case example of uh, executing very well and very strategically in a tough, tough circumstance. Uh, very instructive uh, for us today. And Stephanie and Duncan, to you and your organizations uh, for your insights uh, uh, practical on the field right now today. So on behalf of all of us at the M&A Leadership Council, our outstanding partner organizations, our over 4,000 trainees and alumni organizations, um, thank you uh, for your time. We look forward to talking with you again soon on future M&A Leadership Council webinars and online seminars. So in the meantime, stay safe, uh, stay well, and uh, take care, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now.